Awesome. Um, all right, I think we're recording now, so I will kick it off. Um, like I said, I'm gonna pass it off to Austin in just a second to talk a little more about like Korea itself. But um, this year, the the Global Dreams Conference was in Korea, and uh, we were lucky enough to have uh, seven members of our party um, in attendance. I uh, at Global Dreams, not as official delegates, um, because our party is not uh, a member of the Global Dreams, but um, we were able to send three official youth delegates to Global Young Dreams because our youth caucus is a member of uh, the Global Young Dreams. Um, but it was it was a fantastic opportunity to network with uh, other members of Green parties from all around the world, learn about the movement building that happens internationally and be able to connect it to what we're doing here in this country. Um, I know Jay and Austin will be able to, to add more to that, but like, I really feel like I got to know a lot of awesome people. But with that said, I'm going to pass it off to Austin to talk a little more about uh, Incheon and Korea and like, I don't know, like bring it all together for us, Austin. Why, why, why was Korea such a great place for global games? Okay, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Um, hello, everyone. My name is. Uh, can you see? Can you see me? Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Austin Bayshore. I am the co-chair of the International Committee of the Green Party of the United States, um, the internet, the national delegate for the Yes Caucus as well as a member of the Green Party of Korea. Uh, in June, we had our Global Greens Congress here in Korea. Um, it was in the city of Incheon, which is in the Northwest, um, where the international airport is located. Um, it's a huge industrial city, a uh, very modern city as well. The district in which the Global Greens Congress was selected was only built in 2018, uh, and it, has a dream of becoming the Green New Deal city. Um, we can argue the validity of the Green New Deal in Korea, um, in the Korean government, but it was a very beautiful, modern area. There were two conferences in the Global Greens con Congress. There was the Global Young Greens Congress and the General Global Greens Congress happening simultaneously. The Global Young Greens is independent of the Global Greens, um, however, we just decide to have all of our meetings and congresses at the same time and together. The Global Greens is an international organization of 100 plus green parties from around the world. Um, unfortunately, due to internal conflicts with the Federation of the Americas, uh, the Green Party US is not currently a member of the Global Greens. You, we are determined Global Greens member status by our affiliation with our regional parties. There are a few regions, Europe, Asia Pacific, Africa, and the Americas, um, but due to conflicts surrounding um, the federations of Green Parties of the Americas, we are not members of the Global Greens. Despite the US Green Party's lack of representation, um, in the Global Greens, we were still able to send delegates um, and we're still invited to attend the Global Greens Congress in Korea. The Global Young Greens is one of the largest international coalitions for young people, environmentalists um, in the world. It is separate from the Global Greens. Um, however, we do work together. We're pretty much tied at the hip. The Young Eco-Socialist is a member of the Youth Caucus and is a member of the Global Young Greens. Um, somebody asked in the chat, are we working to be part of the Global Greens or is that a prohibitive issue? It is currently an active debate within the International Committee whether we should rejoin the Global Greens or not. Um, while in Korea, we got to attend the opening of the new office of the Green Party of Korea, National Office of the Green Party of Korea. Um, they had moved from their previous office near the Royal Palaces um, in the cent downtown center of Seoul to more of a um, 
ecological location, a more green location in Seoul near the Han River, the main river that flows through Seoul, separating the city north and south. So we attended their um, opening ceremony of their office, uh, as well as we got to make uh, signs for their protest that they used um, around the city of Seoul. Um, after that, we decided to take a trip to Nogunri. Uh, you might see some familiar faces. Howie Hawkins um, graced us with his presence here in Korea, his first international trip in over 50 years, as well as Mike Feinstein uh, from California Green Party. Uh, we took a trip to Nogunri Peace Park. Um, as you all may know, the Korean War was a war between North and South Korea and the United Nations from June 25th, 1950 until July 27th, 1953. Um, if you had, uh, yesterday, I gave a presentation on ending the Korean War um, and we did do have a recording of it. So if you're interested in learning about the Korean peace process um, and the fact that the Korean War never ended, I encourage everyone to watch that review. Um, but shortly, a month after the start of the Korean War, the North Korean forces had pushed all the way uh, to South Korea. Um, and in anticipation for North Korean forces capturing the central city of Taejeon, the United States Armed Forces ordered all villagers in Nogunri to leave. Nogunri is a small little village. Um, in 1950, it had a population of about 350. Um, and out of fear of North Korean advance, they ordered all the villagers from Nogunri and surrounding villages to leave. Um, in the process, uh, the United States Armed Forces and Air Force issued a kill all order on the Korean Peninsula. It did not matter the age, the gender, um, the ability um, of Korean people, the United States Armed Forces were ordered to shoot any Korean refugee uh, out of fear of North Korea hiding assassins and terrorists in refugee columns. As the villagers from Nogunri were marching down the train track to head to the port city of Busan, the United States Air Force began to attack and strafe these refugees from the sky. Um, in order to avoid air attack on the open train tracks, um, the refugees hid in a tunnel uh, in Nogunri, to which the US first mechanized infantry brigade and cavalry, uh, mechanized cavalry, cavalry fired 50 caliber machine guns for four days and three nights into this uh, tunnel where about 400 to 600 refugees were hiding. Um, in total, about 230 people were confirmed dead. However, 400 people in total are wounded and or missing. Um, we had the honor to be able to take quite a long journey um, from Incheon to Nogunri, which was about three hours to four and a half hours each way. Um, but on the left here, we have the memorial to Nogunri, um, the Nogunri Peace Memorial. In the center is the stream. Um, this stream goes into the tunnel um, where the refugees were hiding, and there were even reported cases of parents drowning their babies um, in the stream to prevent the U.S. forces from hearing their cries, because every time the US forces camping outside the tunnel heard anything inside the tunnel, they would open fire. And then on the right is the observation tower from the end of the Nogunri Peace Hike, which you got to see the whole complex and the whole village from on top of the mountain. After that, we had the opportunity to attend the Korean parliament meeting. We were invited by the Progressive Justice Party of Korea to meet with them in parliament. The Justice Party is the large, one of the largest progressive political parties in Korea. They dream of a united Korean people who can live in a, in, on a peninsula with no discrimination and that respects labor rights. Um, we got to meet Shim sang jung who was the 2017 and 2022 presidential candidate. Um, she is 
um, on the top right photo, she's there shaking hands with Howie Hawkins. Um, we were published in many newspapers in South Korea. Uh, Howie gave a speech about the Green New Deal um, and what that means, because the Korean government did issue their version of a Green New Deal, um, what they would call the Green New Deal. However, um, it's green in name only, uh, while the South Korean government opens coal-fired power plants in Vietnam, they are banning single-use plastic in family restaurants here in Korea. So Howie Hawkins gave an overview of his campaign, what he stood for, um, what he pushed for. Uh, Mike Feinstein gave a presentation on the Americans with Disabilities Act, something that Korea does not have and something that the Justice Party really pushes for, uh, the rights of minority people and the disabled. So that, that was very receptive, uh, his speech on um, his presentation on the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it, as you may know, Mike Feinstein was the mayor of Santa Monica, California, when the Americans with Disabilities Act was um, passed. So it, it was under his duty, under his jurisdiction to see the Americans with Disabilities Act come into fruition in California. Which, funny side note, um, we learned that uh, Shim Sang Jung, the presidential candidate for the Justice Party, um, if I'm able to annotate this woman, um, actually visited Santa Monica, Calif Santa Monica, California while Mike Feinstein was governor or mayor um, and got to see his, uh, his work working with uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and how they cleaned up and made the beaches accessible for disabled peoples. Um, Matthew gave an overview of the left-wing movements, student movements in the, in the United States um, with uh, mainly the movement of the DSA. And then I also gave a speech in Korean to parliamentarians about Korea's lack of anti-discrimination legislation, um, as well as respecting human rights of racial and religious minorities in Korea. But overall, it was very well received. Um, afterwards, our representatives and delegates got to run around Korea um, and explore before the official uh, before the official meeting actually began. Um, Mike Feinstein and Howie Hawkins took a DMZ tour. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what Matthew did, um, but I'm pretty sure he ran around the royal palaces um, and Seoul. All, all the three days before the conference began. There we go. Now I can speak. <laughs> um, I was muted. Yeah, I mean, I, I I went around and I did some you know touristy things during the couple of days off that we had. I went to the Gangnam District, and I thought that was cool. That's the, there's a mural of uh, I'm doing the Gangnam Style dance over there. Um, and yeah, I visited some of the royal palaces, went to some of the traditional things. There's a picture of Mike Feinstein at the DMZ, like Austin said. And then Jay, do you want to explain what you did? Um, I, I found this picture, but I, I don't know. I thought it looked cool. <laughs> yeah, after the conference, I uh, visited Seoul. And that picture on the bottom in the middle is a picture of like a highway that was converted into a park. Um, so that used to be that, that like all used to be highway. Um, and uh, I was hanging out with some of the the greens from other parts of the world. Um, so it was cool to like visit, visit Korea with them. That's this, this stream that he's standing in is called Tonggechon. It's a stream in the center of Seoul. And actually that building behind him um, is a very important textile mill um, in Korea and is the birth of the Korean labor movement. I don't know if you realize this, um, but yeah, that building behind you was the birth of the labor union movement in Korea with the textile workers. Um, and this, this historical stream had been paved over, bulldozed, and they built a highway through there. Um, however, um, this stream was very important to the Korean people because for a thousand years, uh, women and children would wash their clothes and play in this stream. And then just overnight, they bulldozed it and built a highway. Um, so the Korean people fought back, pressured their government, um, and they ended up demolishing that highway and recreating that very important stream for the Korean people.
at the Global Greens Congress, we got to meet a lot of amazing people. Um, starting from the top left photo, uh, we have Frank Cabaneza, who is the presidential candidate for the Green Party of Rwanda here. Um, and this little L sign is his um, campaign slogan that he has. Um, many young Greens delegates got to meet and um, drink a little bit together at the meeting after meetings. Uh, this young lady is the leader of the is the youth leader of the Progressive Party in Korea, who is they are not members of the Greens. However, the um, per, per, Progressive Parties in Korea sent solidarity delegates to the convention um, to talk about um, other issues. The Progressive Party is the political party of the labor unions in Korea. So they were very ecstatic to realize um, Howie Hawkins was in attendance. Um, because believe it or not, a lot of Korean progressives follow Howie. Um, he introduced the Green New Deal. Um, he does a lot for the labor movement in the United States. So they were actually very excited to be able to meet him. Um, so um, the youth leader of the Progressive Party in Korea was very happy to sit down and chat with him. Um, here we have delegates at the photo booth. Um, this is Iram Salim Khan from the Women's Caucus of the Green Party of Pakistan. This is Kim Hemi, the youth, youth vice leader of the Green Party Korea. He is Chani, Chani Kim, the leader of the Green Party of Korea. And he is Han Ho Kyu, who is the um, other vice leader of the Green Party of Korea. Myself and then a delegate from the Green Party of Bolivia. Um, in this center picture, we have uh, the global, I think that was the European Greens Congress. Um, and then here is the Green Party Korea yeah. National Convention. Boston, that workshop was actually a, a workshop on like local electoral organizing. Um, Jay, Mike and I were all in attendance there. It was a really interesting workshop. Ah. Local green organizing, sorry. I saw the European Green Party logos and assumed. Um, but yes, and then this picture was the Congress of the Green Party of Korea um, who had a reggae band, which was kind of surprising. And then the jumbotron, I don't know what to call that. The scrolling jumbotron at the convention center, welcoming everyone to Korea. In total, there are about, I would say, 400 total international delegates at the Congress in Korea. So it was a very healthy turnout for it being so far from every other country. The only close country that can send delegates is Japan. Um, there's no Green Party in North Korea. There's no Green Party in China. Um, and for many South, Central South American delegates, it was a 30, 40 hour journey because there is no direct flight from Central and South America to Korea. Um, so we were very proud to be able to host um, Central and South American delegates at the Global Greens Congress. Um, key takeaways from the Global Young Greens Congress, the role of the Green Party US um, was a hot argument uh, as terms of us, our participation and our membership in the Global Greens. Despite that many Green Parties around the world uh, welcomed us with open arms, and they were very happy to see that we sent delegates to attend this meeting, given the current issues with the um, Federation of the Americas and our relationship there. The ideology uh, of the Global Greens tends to be more malicodist. However, there are some fantastic parties around the world to do more work with. And we also need to consider other parties to face context where there are frequently multiple left-wing parties that operate and the Greens exist purely in the movement for sustainability. The US is the only significant left-wing party. Whereas, sorry, whereas in the Greens, the Greens in the US are the only significant left-wing party. Um, the goals of our movement require international collaboration. There are a lot of Green Party US can learn from the Green parties around the world in the terms of electoral politics. First past the post elections in Canada and England, where Greens actually win. Um, Greens in government in countries such as Australia and New Zealand, 
um, and activism, such as the push for gender equality in Korea, environmental and racial justice and the rights of minorities from our Green Party allies in Rwanda, um, and anti-war and militarism from our Greens in Eastern Europe as well. All right. First off, thank you to all three of you for kind of giving us a synopsis for the first off the trip in Korea. One, I'm jealous. I thought about attending myself and I was like, mm, sounds hot. Uh, do I have to pass this year? <laughs> Let me know when it's like in uh, Greenland or something, though. But let's see here. Facilitate a Q&A. So there's a few rules that I want to make sure I lay out first. I already see people raising their hands, which is great. Um, how I'm planning to do this because I, I, as a facilitator, I might do things differently than you guys have in the past is I do have some questions prepared that we're going to go over first. If you have questions, um, how we plan on doing it is having you put your question in the chat and uh, raise your hand at the same time. So that way we can have you say it and it, that way if there's any questions about what you're actually asking, we can also read it. There's a lot of issues with uh, people who might have speech it, uh, uh, impediments or abilities and that may just not be able to get on speaker on, on webinars or things of that nature. So either put it in chat and raise your hand would be the easiest, but I also just am going to start with the questions I have prepared first, okay? So that's how we plan on doing it. Um, first question that I'm going to get into, try to stop sharing this screen. So I know we briefly touched on it and people already were asking questions in the chat. So I wanna kind of hit on it first head on. We briefly talked on like the FPVA, like how the contentious part of the USA being part of the uh, GYG and just how yes is part of the global young greens, but we're not part of the overall greens. How does that all work? Can, I know Matt and Austin, you're both part of the international committee, correct? Yeah, That's correct. Can you guys kind of uh, explain that to those of us who are maybe not in the know, first off? Matthew, do you want to take it away? Yeah, okay. Make sure, make sure you're unbiased though, because I know you have a preference on the question. <laughs> yeah, I mean- like, For um, the context. Yeah, I, I guess like the, the, the overall context of the, the whole situation is that you know, there, there was some reasonable concerns that our party had about the way we were treated by uh, certain delegates from certain parties in Latin America. Um, and as a result, our national committee voted to, to leave FPBA, which means we're not part of Global Greens. As we mentioned earlier, like Global Greens and Global Young Greens are two separate organizations, and our youth caucus never left Global Young Greens. So that's how we're still a part of Global Young Greens. Um, but like in terms of like the, the whole issue about like rejoining or not rejoining Global Greens, like it's a it's an active discussion that we, we all have to have as a party. It would require a national committee vote. Um, and that's why like a lot of that dialogue is starting to happen over like international committee emails and, and such. Um, there's been some dialogue between FPVA and Global Greens. Uh, there is a letter submitted in which you know they they explain that Green Party US is certainly welcome back into the coalition. They have some of their own conditions that they would like us to meet. And of course we have our own conditions as well that we want uh, FPVA to meet um, in the sense that you know we're our own party and we're autonomous and we get to make our own decisions as a party. Um, yeah, like more specifically like um, a lot of the, the argument is around Sao Paulo Forum, which is a left-wing international meeting that happens um, between several left-wing parties in Latin America. Some of the green parties in Latin America uh, are opposed to uh, green participation in the coalition, both from us as well as uh, the Green Party Colombia. Um, so it's not, it's not just us that they're out there, uh, which I think is also important to recognize. But like, um it, it's kind of a weird predicament because like green party us has never been like officially a part of sao paulo forum um we did just have a vote like we had a vote through national committee that we were interested in like sending delegates uh to 
Sao Paulo Forum, but like that that still hasn't like officially happened. So um awesome, why don't you add a little bit more here? The 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 co-chair of international committee. Yes. So basically what happened is the Green Party US decided to participate in the Sao Paulo Forum. The Sao Paulo Forum is a coalition of Latin American left-wing socialist communist parties. Um, for example, members of the Sao Paulo Forum include the Workers' Party of Brazil, Lula's Party, the Communist Party of Cuba, as well as the United Socialist Party of Venezuela, um, Maduro's party. Um, FPVA, the Federation of the Green Parties of the Americas, was not happy with our participation um, or our want to participate in that international organization, that regional organization, because those parties directly compete against green parties in national elections. They told us, we do not want you participating um, in politics, joining organizations of parties that we compete against in elections. Fair. Um, but we told the FPVA, we don't want to participate with right wing green parties. Um, and it led to a pretty much a stalemate. There are a lot of issues around FPVA, um, specifically with the Green Party of Mexico and their reintroduction of the death penalty. Uh, the Green Party of Mexico um, allying themselves with electoral alliances with right wing political parties in order to get in power, as well as their um, unsupport of LGBT rights in Mexico. Um, so that was our big concern. Um, and then for two years, the FPVA told us, hey, um, don't join the Sao Paulo Forum, don't join the Sao Paulo Forum, don't join the Sao Paulo Forum, um, but we did it anyways. So FPVA downgraded our membership status to observer. Um, and then when we posted delegates on our website, um, appointed to the Sao Paulo Forum, uh, FPVA said, it's time for you guys to leave. Um, you are in violation of our rules. Uh, there are violations of rules on both sides. It wasn't just fully our fault, um, but uh, we are currently in negotiations. As Matthew said, um, FPVA delegates during our Congress in Korea asked the Green Party United States to return to FPVA. Um, they did send myself a letter um, as the co-chair of the International Committee stipulating that if you want to return to FPVA, you must prove that you are no longer in any international organization which directly competes, uh, competes against Greens in national elections. Um, and you must submit a letter of reinstatement from your Green Party's National Committee to the FPVA, and then the FPVA will vote. There's two, one or two other things included on in that letter. Um, to, to us, the International Committee. Um, can't think of them right now. Uh, but yes, they, they asked us to return and then gave us a list of things we need to uh, approve in order to return to FPVA. However, the Green Party International Committee is currently um, cautious on returning to FPVA um, because FPVA has not taken up any of our concerns, such as our not full participation, but our just going in a room and sitting with uh, left-wing political parties in Latin America um, and having the autonomy to um, just have a conversation with those organizations. Can I add a quick point? I just, I just wanted to say like, I, I think it's also like more specifically like the Green Party of Mexico um, who we've had a lot of challenges with. Um, it's only they, them, only them. Yeah, yeah, they, they they very specifically hold a lot of power and influence within FPVA. And, um, you know, I mean, it's it's been interesting because like I've been able to like have a lot of good dialogue with like some of their members as well as members of other parties in the coalition. It's just going to take a lot of conversation, I think. And, you know, uh, it's also going to take getting over. Um, so know, something like that older, I want to highlight drama. <laughs> is like based on the base camp conversations is you guys interacted with various members in person and issues were very limited. So I think what this kind of highlights as an international organization and I'm gonna kind of point to Jay, he talked a lot about how it excited him as working one-on-one -on -one with people that you're allowed to get allowed, if I can talk, um, able to get past those barriers easier as an international and national organization. Jay, do you want to talk about how as a young person 
um, the barriers as a youth how sometimes you're not taken seriously and sometimes that like quick to angerness across borders but working one-on-one -on -one, you were able to overcome that internationally yeah i think one interesting thing was comparing the conversation about these international parties and delegates that happened in our online spaces before the conference like over the past few years to what we experience in person to those same uh parties in latin america um it was sort of like uh, the delegates that we met from those parties were not uh, reflective of our conversations about those parties in our like youth spaces. Um, and, and not that those conversations were not well informed. They were well informed, but it, I guess we were a lot more oppositional in our online discussions um, about other countries' parties. But when we were in person, we were able to find areas of collaboration, um, areas of agreement, rather than focusing on the areas where we disagree, which we often seem to do in our online spaces. Okay, I, I love that. And I kind of think that question goes really well into what Ian Mooney was talking about. Um, um, can I add one more thing? Yeah. Um, another factor is just like there's a lot of personality conflicts, right? So like we see that in our party here in the United States, we see that in all organizations. Like there's the issues with the party organizationally, um, and then there's like being able to cross those with face-to-face -face conversation. But then sometimes the downside of that is sometimes someone is just a jerk, right? And that can make um, our our diplomacy a lot harder. And we we saw that uh, specifically in the situation. There are some people from other parties in our federation who are like just kind of mean people, and they were demonstrating that in person at the conference, and it was causing a lot of problems. Um, so we kind of see like a, a little bit of the pros and the cons of meeting in person, um, and kind of like the the individual aspect of this sort of like you know it's like a light diplomacy. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. All right, Ian, go ahead. Wait, I lost him. Where did his face go? I was trying to hit unmute. Oh no, forgive me, Ian. Raise your hand again. Hold on, I'm going down the well, list. Thank you, I've got it now. Thank God. Uh, so uh, recently in the Revelator, there was an article. Uh, actually, first of all, let me say thank you so much, young comrades, uh, for your work promoting the interests of international friendship. Uh, may all our efforts flourish into a beautiful coalition of uh, progressive work across the world. Uh, recently in the Revelator, an article was published from the Youth Contingency of the UN where they were uh, discussing progressive climate policies and the need to like act in the interests of earth and its people over corporate and, and government interests. They were putting this in internationalist terms, but not in like terms of labor or exploited peoples or oppressed masses conflicting with capitalism as a system. And so my question is, in doing youth oh, organizing, forgive me, do you find that this like Marxist notion of a struggle of oppressed people against the system of capitalism is still relevant, that this has meaning in uh, political organization or are young people putting this in different terms? Thank you so much. Can I start off? I mean, in terms of like uh, the scope of like this conference that we attended, I thought it was really interesting that like even when we were talking with members of parties that have historically been uh, more at odds with our party for being uh, more openly socialist, um, when you speak to like young members of all of those parties, they don't shy away from the words so much. Um, and like, I, I think in terms of like youth organizing as a whole, I think young people are not shy to use the word and throw it around. Um, in terms of like what the word actually means, you know, you have like different people that have different takes. Um, but like, I think young people in terms of like the, the larger like global movement for, for like green parties, um, I think we're all sort of like, like we're, we're sort of driving our parties uh, to adopt 
um, a more nuanced vision that like, you know, talks about sustainability in a way that also empowers workers because like these things are not mutually exclusive. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I really appreciated at this conference, just being able to realize that like so many young people around the world realize that. It's very exciting. Um, speaking of in Korea specifically, um, Korea has a very strong national security act. So any mention of left wing communist, socialist, anarchist, political organizing will actually get your organization banned and all your members thrown in prison, um, which is unfortunate for Korea. However, a lot of members in Korea are ecological socialist anarchists, um, which is very exciting. Um, between the last international conference in 2017 in Liverpool to 2023 here in Korea, Scotland, Japan, England and Wales, uh, Australia, New Zealand, the Green Party US, Canada, mm, I think Lebanon, I spoke with a Lebanon delegate, all of these countries guided by their youth caucuses, adopted ecological socialism into their party constitution, into their party manifesto, into the ideology of the Greens. Uh, so it's very exciting seeing, talking with the youth delegates from Japan, uh, speaking about peace, uh, Japan upholding their uh, peace acts in their, in their national constitution, um, as well as anti-capitalism, tying that with the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster um, and speaking with the um, Maori and Aboriginal delegates from Australia and New Zealand, Aotearoa, um, speaking about um, interconnecting eco-socialism with their indigenous and Aboriginal movements as well. So yeah, a, a lot of international Greens are not afraid to speak about it. However, we do have to realize in some countries such as Venezuela, um, Central and South American countries, the socialist and communist parties are at odds with the Greens and um, are, they don't have a positive relationship with left-wing laborism uh, because of the repression they face under these left-wing political organizations. Um, yeah, I'll just agree with both of you. I, I would say that um, I was, that was one of the questions that I had, right? Um, these are young people from parties that are not known for, green parties that are not known for embracing socialism. Um, but I found that I didn't find a young person who didn't embrace socialism, in, like that came from any green party around the world. Um, and yeah, like there is a, there was a tension within the parent parties um, on that question. I would say that there wasn't, it wasn't overt, like the, the, the theme of social, so, socialism wasn't the focus of the panels and the sessions at the events. Um, it was like, um, it was overt for the youth, but it was not overt for the greater um, organization. Um, I think it was kind of like, there was like a, a, a thread underpinning all of it, uh, but it was not, it was not as overt as you would find in other socialist organizations, you know, where it's like a, a major focus, a major theme. Uh, but it definitely would have been for nice. young people like I remember there were young people from the Green Party of Australia and they were like are you socialist are you socialist you know like they were just like asking people um and it was like everyone is yes um yeah okay that's it it would have been nice yeah. to have a, a session on ecological socialism however due to the our host country um making being a socialist or communist a jailable offense um, the Global Green Congress and the Green Party of Korea um, was not willing to take that step to invite 600 foreigners to this country and then it just being shut down by the government because we have a, so, uh, a, set, a session on socialism, on anti-capitalism. Um, so that is the reason why we didn't specifically speak about um, socialism, anarchism, or any left-wing um, movements officially within the Congress um, because we didn't want to get shut down and everyone get deported. All right, so I just wanna have a quick answer to a clarifying question that Justin, uh, I'm sorry if I butchered your last name, Pugdolino asked, is, is Young Greens Youth Caucus and Young Eco-Socialists the same thing? Or is Young Greens International and the other United States different? So it depends on who's using it. So I would say for, if you're asking anybody in the United States, Young Greens, Youth Caucus, Young Eco-Socialists, yes. 
it's all interchangeable. We're all talking about the same thing. Now, if you're talking about at a global scale, it might depend on the country. Um, maybe Austin could talk about how in Korea it might be a little different, but I'm pretty sure everybody in the United States agrees that we all call it different things. Most of us in the caucus just call it yes, all capital letters, because um, ain't nobody got time to say all that all the time. Yeah, we're all very different. Specifically talking about Green Party Korea, they actually have two Young Greens caucuses. They have the Youth Greens, which is more geared towards high school students. Um, Green Party Korea is a special situation because it is the only political party where you can join before the legal requirement, the legal age, where you can join if you're under the legal age to join a political party because of the formation of the Youth Greens, um, which is mainly high school students, um, first, second year college students. And then they have their Young Greens caucus, which is like everybody else um, that goes up until 35, 34, 34. Yeah. So I want to go back to some of the questions that we had prepared, and then we'll go back to the chat and get a few more um, questions answered. Remember, for those of you that might have missed it, if you have a question, you need to raise your hand as well as post the question in the chat so we can kind of pre-screen them um, beforehand. Um, also, if you're just looking to chat or clarify something, we're not going to call on you as a clarifying thing. Um, this isn't one of those kind of things. So the next one is more of a funner, well, fun question. Um, so what part of the conference struck you the most and why? So we're going to start with Matt. He's been quiet today. I'm sorry, what was the question again? What part of the conference struck you the most and why? Um, I think the part of the conference that struck me the most was actually everything that happened, like when we're networking outside of the conference um, with other young people, like, I really enjoyed like getting to know other young goons and like getting past like some of the some of the divisions that divide like some of our members and our parent parties like I mean Jay and I for example like we got along really well with uh, this this one woman her name is Davin from Mexico and like I mean we, we were all up in a hotel room like having fun and like Honestly, like, you know, it might not have been like business per se, right? But like these kinds of things, like being able to have fun, being able to create community at these conferences is how we're going to be able to build international movements. You know, um, I think I think that's just like a crucial piece, being able to have fun at these conferences and like, you know, we're, we're able to like build bridges that way too. And even even with people that weren't young, right? Like I I was able to like connect culturally with like so many of the the Latin Americans that were at this uh, congress. Like we were all up dancing on stage at the banquet dinner um, to like you know Mexican folk songs and stuff like that. And it was like it was so much fun. It really was a lot of fun uh, being able to get to know people that way and like we're able to create relationships that way. It's called relational organizing. And, you know, I I think um, it's something that all of our parent parties can learn from. Jay? Um, I think one thing was that, um, I, I feel like the, the biggest thing was that a feeling that we're not alone out there. Like it can feel like we're very fringe, you know, here in the United States, but in other parts of the world, our party, our values are not as fringe. Um, so that was one takeaway. Another one was that um, there are there are parties that are we always hear about the parties that are doing better than us, right? But there are many international green parties that are not doing as well as us. Um, so they're like there's it's kind of like a continuum. Um, there's always going to be people who are more advanced than we are, and there's always going to be, be people that are less advanced than we are in terms of our organizing. Um, and, and there's also like the same thing can be said for political climates, right? Um, other Green parties were like shocked that we had to win in first past the post systems. Like they're like, you have to get 51%, you have to get like 40%, you know, that was blowing their minds because for them, they can get into parliament with like 5% um, of the vote or something like that. Um, and then at the same time, we are hearing about green organizing conditions where it was like hazardous to your health, right? So like we heard about um, uh, elected officials, green elected officials in Venezuela, um, they had to be in out of country, right? Um, they had to serve from out of country. Um, we also heard about um, 
the 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 Rwandan presidential candidate before, like um, a, a part of his his campaign team, his vice presidential candidate was killed, was murdered, um, as connected to his green organizing. So you know, conditions are oppressive here in the United States, and we we know that because of what the people in other countries are telling us. But we also know that they could be a lot more oppressive. Um, so it's important for us to like not feel like it's impossible to do here, right? Because it is possible. Um, other, other, we see the example of other parties um, that have succeeded in first past post systems. Um, and then we should also like count our blessings that we are allowed to believe what we believe. You know, we deal with um, various forms of oppressions, but none of them is like threatening to our lives, right? Um, okay, and then the last thing is that, um, yeah, just a lot of a lot of green organizations are struggling with similar things that we're struggling with, right? Onboarding, having enough people to fill officer positions, um, especially the young, the youth organizations. Um, everyone is kind of struggling with the similar situations, um, and I think it's not it's not a, a a personal failing of us to be struggling with the same sort of like general organizing things. But we don't have to be stuck on it. You know, we can learn from people who have who have addressed those issues, who have fixed those problems. Um, and, and we should be doing that. And it's good to be like in touch with other people as a result. We'll get over. Austin? I have two funny moments from the Congress that stuck out to me. Um, I live in a rather rural area of Korea, and we do have a regional Green Party here. Um, and members of our regional Green Party are just rice farmers who just vibe, live their life. Um, I was the only foreigner they had ever met previously. Um, so seeing them get to come to this international Congress and kind of like not know what to do all of a sudden, seeing all these people from 100 countries around the world, um, sharing that space with them, allowing them to learn more about the world around them directly from these people. Um, some of them asked me, oh, wait, Australia still has indigenous people. I was like, yeah, they're here at our Congress right here, living proof, Australia still got indigenous people. Um, so it was a very interesting um, learning moment for all of us. But I was in conversation with one of the delegates from um, the Dominican Republic, specifically speaking on our uh, stances on different issues and our political alignment. And I had brought up to the the Dominican Republic delegate doesn't really have an ideology from what I understood, other than just green. Um, so I brought up, yeah, the Green Party US is an eco-socialist political party. We adopted eco-socialism in 2016. So we were concerned about our relationship with FPVA, but he said, what is that first word you said when you described yourself? And I said, eco-socialist. He's like, what's eco mean? I was like, ecology. And he said, yes, at the end of the day, we all want a healthier, cleaner planet for us all. And it does not matter our political divisions, what we nitpick and how we micro identify ourselves. He said, at the end of the day, we're all ecologists and want to live peacefully on this planet together. So that really stuck with me as well. Um, one more thing I'll add is that uh, another thing that I, I realized at this conference, and I, I feel like I realized this a lot in the Green Party, our party has a very long history. Like it's, you know, um, there were people at the conference, first of all, they were like, who's been at every Global Greens conference for so long? And like, it was like Mike Feinstein and one other person had been like at Global Greens Conference for decades. Um, and there are other delegates that could remember doing things with the Green Party US pre-2000, you know, like big organizing um, campaigns, you know, lots of stuff. And it's sort of like, my big question is like, does anyone know what happened? Like, I, I don't know why, like, it feels like there hasn't been 40 years of organizing before the work we're doing today. Like, sometimes it feels like we're building from scratch, but our party has existed for decades. And it's just like so confusing. Um, so that was one of the questions that I was kind of like wrangling with while talking with old, older delegates um, from other international parties. Um, but it's also something that I deal with in, in our party here uh, regularly as well. I think the green movement often struggles from defections. Like uh, many people start with the greens, as we can see in the US, many politicians start with the greens 
and then they get sucked in to the two-party trap. Um, and that happens in a lot of major countries as well. Um, a lot of countries, people get their political start from the Greens and then capitulate to the system or find, get lost in the power um, and get lost in the sauce. All right. Thank you guys for that. I think I had some follow-up questions that's formed in my own mind. So I'm sure some people are stewing on their thoughts. So this next question kind of builds off of it a little bit. How has attending the Global Young Greens Conference expanded your ability as organizers? We're gonna start with Jay this time. Yeah, so I thought the two most relevant workshops I went to were one, I see Darren. Okay, so one was about um, the the green ladder, like the green, uh, it was like the organizing ladder or um, it was like building the party up the ladder, like climbing the um, the rungs of the ladder. Um, and it was just sort of like, um, you know, these are the things that you need to have a, like a functional organization, right? You need to have bylaws, you need to have, have a conduct policy, you need to have disciplinary strategies, you need to have an onboarding system, you need to have a database, you know? And I thought that was like, like that's the meat and potatoes of organizing that we really struggle with at least in my experience here in the US Green Party. So that was one. And the other one was like a session about um, uh, target to win, which is kind of like the Green Party of England and Wales strategy around local elections, um, which I know we're uh, trying to adopt in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and then the, another part of that same session or kind of like four mini sessions was about how to engage volunteers, um, which I think is just a, a, a skill that we really need to develop in our party. Um, so I think those were really or organizing focused sessions. Um, and I think that they were they were really good. And I'm still trying to like chase down the recordings for them because um, I think those are really important. And honestly, we should probably hire some of the presenters for the sessions to present at a future annual national meeting or at our state party meetings. They are from organizations that help green parties organize um, around the world. Yeah, I'll stop there. Austin? Can you repeat the question, please? How has attending the conference expanded your ability as an organizer? Oh my gosh. Um, as the international co-chair of the Green Party US, it, hello. Um, I met so many amazing people and I got so many contact information. Um, we just released a statement in support of Korea and Japan alongside the uh, Green Party of Hawaii to oppose the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster site dumping radioactive waste into the Pacific Ocean. Um, we're working currently working with the Green Party of England and Wales to release a statement on the rights of refugees and the rights of migrants. Um, we have so much in common with all of these Green Parties around the world. I think a lot of people don't realize um, is a lot of our problems are shared. Our problems with the migration crisis, deportations, um, the border issues, the Green Party of England and Wales have also had those issues for the past 20 some years. Windrush, the forced deportation of Caribbean migrants who are citizens of the United Kingdom um, back to the Caribbean, um, the rejection of people seeking asylum on boats entering the United Kingdom thanks to the Brexit deal um just the lorries full of or the sorry the what's the american english word semi trucks full of um migrants who didn't make it showing up in england um who unfortunately passed away during their journey we have so much in common with green parties around the world on certain issues um that we definitely need to take advantage of this and work together because we cannot solve it, these crises on our own. Our mm -hmm. planet and our future will not survive a climate crisis on top of Cold War 2.0. And Matt? I guess um, for me, like, I think in addition to like the points that Austin and Jay raised, like I think 
attending this conference really like expanded like my scope of what the green movement actually is and what it means um because like i mean in in the us like our political parties are larger in scope in terms of like the issues that we focus on compared to a lot of our uh, sister parties in other countries um I feel like I have a better understanding now of like where the green movement originates from. Like I was able to talk to a lot of older members of other parties. And like, I think, I think it's relevant to like understand uh, where we come from, right? Because um, it helps us like, like center and highlight like exactly like what is, what is like what are our top goals as a party right like obviously it's to get people elected and to make changes right um that that you know will have a lasting effect on uh, our country and our world right um we are in a climate crisis as austin said and it's going to take international collaboration to solve these things and um obviously that doesn't mean green party us gets to get pushed around by uh, other green parties but it, 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 it does mean that Green Party US also has to, to work with um, other parties as well. Like it, 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 it's a little bit of both. We, we contribute and we also, um, you know, receive a give and take. Um, so I guess like learning, learning more about like the, the background of the Green Movement was interesting. No, thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll also add that. Um, I think, I think the Global Young Greens specifically allows us the way to have a seat at an international coalition. Like Global Greens is an international coalition, right? There is a lot of drama between the Green Party US and other international parties, right? We, we, international Green Parties. But the Global Young Greens, our youth caucus is a full member, like almost 100% full. There's like a little bit of a minor thing, minor issue. Um, but like we are a respected member of the Global Young Greens organization and the Global Young Greens organization has a seat at the table at a lot of like international youth groupings. So like um, the Global Young Greens is gonna send a delegation to the next COP, um, the conference of the parties, the kind of like international uh, climate change um, meetings that occur. Um, so like we could send Young Greens to that, whereas our Young Greens like, we are not really respected as a strong environmental group in a lot of environmental circles in our country. But because many of the other Green parties are, then they have people in, in parliament, people in the European parliament. Um, we can kind of like piggyback a little bit on their success um, so that we can be at the table, even if we don't agree with all of their policies, right? But like we can, we have like, a, they open the door for us to have like, our representatives join those meetings and to be like full members and not necessarily observers, you know? So I think that's really powerful. That adds to our organizing ability for um, international and global issues that, um, you know, it's hard for us to get to those tables sometimes as, a, as an organization that's not um, well respected in, in our country. When we were in Korea, we got to visit the Korean parliament and we would have never been able to talk to members of parliament if the Green Party Korea was not in an electoral alliance with the Justice Party of Korea, who has six members of parliament. Um, so because Green Party Korea had laid that framework and that foundation for us, we were able to go and talk about the Americans with Disability Act, Green New Deal, the rights of sexual minorities and left wing student movements to the members of parliament in Korea. Ooh, sorry, I was trying to make something bigger. You know, for being young, I sometimes struggle with tech just as much as other people. Um, my next question is kind of about the business of the event, because it's like, what did y'all even do? Like, do y'all just have fun? Uh, no, they, they did some work. Uh, I swear, I, I looked at it. Um, I, I'm kind of the, you know, co-chair and whatnot. I had to make sure they did some stuff. So GYG was wrapped up with, uh, with what they called the Korea Declaration. So uh, it's primary focus was on some big big ticket items ranging from climate crisis to biodiversity, social justice, peace, um, and security, as well as democracy. Uh, I know that it's a very 
wonderful document. I will screen share and y'all can kind of see what I'm talking about. Right here. And I will drop the link. Yeah, I guess it's like a this is like a consensus document for all the Greens, um, global green parties, um, which you the know. Main, the main focus of this document was to make ecocide a crime. To make the intentional killing of nature a criminal offense. Um, and then there were there were bits about um, respecting biodiversity, social justice, LGBTQIA stuff um, with the current uh, issues going on in the center of Africa with LGBT people there. The African Greens were quite concerned um, and the Green Party of Rwanda really stepped up to um, push their northern neighbors um, to respect the rights of LGBT people to just be able to exist in the heart of Africa. Um, so we're very proud of our African delegates um, being able to stand up and say, hey, this isn't it. Um, and our delegates from um, Japan as well, bringing up uh, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster um, and the Japanese nationalist right-wing governments wanting to dump or planning to dump their waste products into the ocean. And we signed an international agreement condemning this um, in Korea as well. So we did do a lot of work, Young Greens specifically uh, reformed our working manifesto, our constitution of the Young Greens, um, and had a lot of contentious issues surrounding um, elections uh, um, and the reformation of the Global Young Greens. But yes, we did do a lot of work in just these short four days. So could you kind of tell a little bit about the Global Young Greens business that you guys participated in? I know there were some pretty contentious things, um, hotly debated uh, that was going on, whether it was steering committee elections and whatnot. A lot of uh, the contention was actually about the relationship between Global Young Greens and the Global Greens, actually, um, because the Global Young Greens is very firm in that it's autonomous, that you know young people um, have a vision to contribute to the, the global green movement, right, that um, is distinct. Um, and like, one of the things that we had to vote on uh, at Global Young Greens that was hotly debated was about whether or not our uh, steering committee should have to be made up of uh, young green members of global greens parties, um, because this was something that uh, the the global greens had actually like some members of the 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 global green steering committees um were like trying to like push us to to do right because the the global young greens is a bit broader of a coalition that's why like our youth caucus is able to be a part of it because there's there's other youth organizations that are part of global young greens that are not necessarily green parties um, or in the case of some countries, there's multiple green parties that, you know, one green party is part of the global greens and one isn't, let's say. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think that was, that was definitely a piece of contention right there. It was just like talking about what is the relationship between global young greens and global greens. Yeah, for, for context, um, it was like a convention, right? So there are a bunch of workshops, but then there are also a bunch of sessions that were for business. So there was Global Greens Congress business, which we did not participate in. And then there's Global Young Greens sessions business. And it's, it's kind of like, um, it's sort of like, it's more like the, um, uh, sorry, not the annual national meeting, the presidential nominating convention, where there's credentialing that occurs. Um, people are like marked as delegates or not delegates. There's vote cards that go out. Um, I, I've gone to in-person DSA conventions and it kind of was like that, where you had to have your credentials checked and you're given a vote card and decisions were made. Like you might have seen some of the pictures where they're like delegates voting yes or no on different topics. Like it was a it was a business meeting um, and we were determining uh, there were like different proposals we were voting on that had been uh, drafted before. Um, I think one of the big ones we did was we decided to have an official Global Young Greens platform. Um, so that that that'll have like a what does the global young green stand for? What do we agree upon? 
Um, that was kind of like the context of the decision making that was happening. And then some of the decisions were more contentious than others. And because we were there together, there was kind of like debate back and forth, yeah. um, some arguing, some bickering, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but it was it was like, you know, uh, the, the impact could have been really big, you know, depending on when people are really invested in decision going one way or the other. Um, so that was that was really powerful to be a part of. Um, it's, it's powerful to be a part of people from all around the world um, that have uh, similar interests and are passionate and making de collective decisions together. Um, it, it was really uh, amazing to be a part of. Anything to add? All right. Um, it's getting to the time. I do want to have a final ending with open floor questions for anybody that has any for our presenters. Um, it could just be Yes Caucus related, or it could be more global Young Greens Conference related. Um, just please raise your hand and we will call on you for this last 15 minutes. Otherwise, I will continue to harass them with mine. So, Amy L. Sachs, let me select you by unmuting you. If I can click on her, come on, ask to unmute. There we go. Hey, y'all. Just uh, curious, it seems like with us old uh, geezers in the party, uh, Ukraine is kind of a lightning rod for controversy, and I'm just curious what it's like for you. And I will hang up and listen. Specifically at the Global Greens Congress, it was a large issue. Uh, it wasn't the only thing we talked about, but it was a big issue that we did discuss, uh, the issue in Ukraine. Um, and it was actually got into a little bit of a, a schism, a European schism, um, because obviously there was a member of parliament from Germany who was very big on arming Ukraine, sending everything possible to Ukraine. Um, he was actually one of the worst delegates <laughs> the European Greens could have chosen, in my opinion, to send to this international congress, but he is the one of the leaders of the Federation of the European Greens, so we got to give him that slack. Um, there was a there was a there's an incident featuring the Greens from the Middle East um, and European Greens, where the delegates from Lebanon were screaming um, or shouting, um, "No arms to Ukraine! Cancel the shipments! Stop the war!" Um, and the European Greens were kind of just like. <laughs> um, what's going on? So yeah, there was a big issue, um, and it is very divisive depending on what federation or what country you're from. Most of the Middle Eastern Greens were uniform in their for their dissatisfaction with the arms shipments, weapon shipments um, to Ukraine. Um, I do not think the Global Greens took a position on arms shipments. Um, I believe the Global Greens specifically said y'all need to sit in a room and talk this out yeah. the war needs to end so to give advice so how yes kind of thing uh discusses things because I, I think amy might have been asking like youth in general um we have a base camp so we have a ukraine discussion um that is ever-changing and people post in it frequently not frequently it depends on the week um where they post their thoughts concerns and whatnot and people respond and it's just an ongoing discussion of feelings, thoughts, and whatnot, but yes does not have an official stance on it. Um, so that's kind of what I would say is each individual and yes has their own opinions in regarding Ukraine. Um, but that was the Global Greens one. And I, I can I heard a little bit about the European a few different times uh during their trip. Matt, go ahead. I would also say, like, I mean, we were at this Congress with uh Howie Hawkins, who has I uh, had a hot opinion on the issue that I happen to disagree with, uh, quite frankly, but um, it was still like healthy conversation to have, right? And like, it's the kind of conversation that we're gonna have to have as a party, like always, right? Like, we're not always all going to agree on everything. Um, but finding ways to work together is still important. Um, so I don't know. I guess like there is a lot of uh, finding finding common ground on issues that we could find common ground on being done at this conference um, in order to you know respect the interest of coalition building. We we all I'll agreed say, that. Oh, sorry. 
I'll just say like that it didn't come up very much um, for me in my experience. Um, I, I think that there is kind of like a loose consensus, definitely among European Greens, but among, among a bunch of the different Green parties. That's kind of more in line with how we stand, you know, supportive of arms to Ukraine. Um, that is not in line with uh, our, our national party stance. Um, and we just kind of didn't really talk about it that much. And, um, and, I, and I, thought, I thought that was fine. Um, yeah. All right. David Molino has his hand raised. I have asked you to unmute. Let's hear your question, please. Yes, I want to thank you, Austin, Jay, and, and Matt, for uh, your, your, all your efforts. You guys are very impressive. I've been organizing for, I'm sorry, decades. And uh, your guys' efforts, I just, you know, I just thank you so much for putting in all that you're doing to try to make, you know, uh, the world a better place, because that's what you're doing. Here in Hawaii, uh, we really appreciate, too, supporting our, our call about Fukushima. Uh, it's very concerning because the Pacific Ocean is going to be completely polluted uh, with nuclear radiation. I mean, I, to eat fish, I think, at this point is really tenuous. I don't think people should be really doing that. But we want to thank you for that uh, profusely. And uh, and we uh, also have a uh, proposal to Green Party U.S. to call for a ceasefire and uh, negotiations for uh, Ukraine, because um, that is, you know, that's what the uh, it's our um, our uh, pillar of peace, you know, the um, uh, nonviolent key value, and then also the platform. So the only way we're ever going to stop a war is for people have to stand up. And, and say, here's where I stand. And so that's what we're calling and asking for your support for that. I've sent you guys an email and I, and I hope that we can work together on that. And I mean, thank you so much once again for you guys. I'm just really impressed by all that you've been doing. And I really um, share your, 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 your activities. Oh, also here we have Christine Han and Anne Wright living here in Hawaii. And they have been to you know, Korea on the, on the line there to try to like end that war, you know? So, uh, we have a lot of activists here. Who, so thank you so much. Thank you, David. Um, Jay, and, uh, you posted something in chat. Did you want to comment on that real quick? Sure, yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, Cassidy talked about our uh, our discussions about this topic and our all of our, our all of our national committee votes are informed by a lot of discussion within our caucus. I mean, by specifically, I mean, our caucus's national committee votes. Um, and we are, yeah, we were supportive of the demands with the March action and the March coalition, um, uh, uh, the Ukraine action, but we were not supportive of the actions The we were more supportive of the demands and less supportive of the coalition of the February action um, that like passed almost like 50-50, like it just barely passed. Um, that was a big problem for us. In the future, we're gonna put out a statement, like it was very, very frustrating to have that vote passed um and next time we'll be more organized and we will like basically say like this is completely unacceptable that coalition was completely unacceptable for our caucus and i think everyone is saying that it was fine and i think there are people who are willing to enter that coalition again and that's going to be a big stink if that happens um, because we are not we're going to be like putting out statements and aggressively fighting um for us to never enter a coalition like that again and it does look like Austin has something to say. I was gonna say um, thank you so much to our comrades, allies, friends, brothers and sisters in Hawaii as well. Um, a lot of similar issues between uh, East Asia and Hawaii that I was so honored to get that email from the Green Party of Hawaii co-chairs saying, yes, um, we will assist your anti-Fukushima dumping um, statement and i was so proud of being able to do that with you guys so thank you all right looks like craig posted a question in the chat um i don't know if you want to speak or if you want me to read it out but i would give you the opportunity to speak if you so choose where'd it go i'll read it out so what are the two or three things that Yes Caucus wants the National Party and or a steering committee to focus on ahead of next year? So I would just kind of, as a co-chair, I'm gonna kind of clarify a few different things on this. Uh, normally I wouldn't comment too much. So to give some groundwork here, 
the way yes kind of works is we don't expect the steering committee to guide the entire national party they're what seven people like the national party is is supposed to be 50 states in order to be a working national party we need to work together and i saw someone post in the uh, chat that civil debate is necessary the, the listserv is not civil debate it is monstrous i don't go there's not a day that we go without somebody complaining about the listserv um and very rarely do we have a single problem with cat fights in our listservs um, on base camp and we don't use listserv but that's basically the same idea we work towards progress and i we don't have two to three things that i would say we are specifically working towards but in general we are looking towards getting people elected specifically wanting to get young greens in national positions and we want to see the party prosper um those would be the three things that i say that in general our party would be looking like our caucus would be looking for but i would also like to see the other three people chime in what they think the caucus in general would be looking for um my first thought was just like get out of the way like the national party seems to be a major impediment for local state organizing. Um, it's a big drain on our attention and it's it's kind of it's stressful and it pushes people away from our local organizing. So just kind of like take care of the administrative business that needs to happen and then otherwise just like stay out of the way. Um, that's that's my request. Yeah, I mean I I, I think I would just want to add like, you know, I think it's the steering committees uh, role to lead by example and like to, um, you know, act as good representatives of this party and to, um, you know, push for accountability and community and, um, you know, like things like that. Like I, I, I just think there's so many people in our generation that are completely turned off by the way our party. Uh, acts amongst each other um it's not good organizing and like you know especially in a world where like everything's burning down all around us like it's not accomplishing anything you know i i don't like to see it right but like the the truth is like our party has sort of shrunk a little bit um you know we, we we've let divisions like um completely totally like destroy our ability to function as a coalition and like i i think that you know obviously uh civility and respect does not mean no accountability it does not mean you know uh tossing out like bad arguments and uh tossing out conspiracy theories and stuff like that but it, it you know it does mean like having some ability to have conversation and um, I don't know. I, I think like how a lot of members of our party could do um, more to like understand things about like transformative justice and those principles, right? Like a lot of like the principles behind like restorative justice, um, I think actually like guide like the, the way that a lot of our young organizers uh, compose themselves because um, we recognize like we don't have the time to let, you know, insignificant internal divisions divide us. Like they, there has to be more done to streamline um, the the party, right? Like I know we're a decentralized party, right? But like decentralization does not mean disorganization. Austin, do you have anything to add? I got no comment except we need a, a rapid response team or something. <laughs> <laughs> we submitted that Fukushima statement and it took a week and a half for the central committee or steering committee to get back on it. I was like, they're going to start releasing it any moment now. We have, we don't know, but the Japanese government going to start releasing it anytime soon. Come on, y'all. Sorry for harassing our central, our steering committee at the email lists, but we got it out eventually. It got out this morning. So, woohoo. <laughs> Thank you, steering committee. Sorry for the harassment. With one minute left, I just want to end up end with a few little notes. Is the yes committee, the yes caucus is the strongest caucus the, the Green Party has. Mm -hmm. We have the most funds of any caucus, we have the most people of any caucus, and we have the most turnout of any caucus. Um, we have strong ideas and we will help whatever way we can. 
and we want collaboration. So whether you are a single state looking for help or a city or whatever, um, just looking for somebody to give ideas, reach out. I know Austin's echoing everything that I believe in, Matt is echoing, and so is Jay. If you have youth in your state who want to get involved and you, maybe your state just isn't ready for them, send them to us, we'll get them up there. Um, our, our website is yesgp.org. There you go. I don't think it, it's not a clickable link. Somebody make it a clickable link for me. Um, I might have put it wrong. I don't know. Matt? Yeah, I, I also just wanted to like say thank you to all the people that helped uh, fund my trip to Korea, right? Um, I, I don't know if Jay or Austin also have people they want to shout out, but I really want to shout out obviously the Youth Caucus for paying for my lodging. And I also want to shout out uh, the Green Party in New Jersey and the North Carolina Green Party for their generous donations. Um, and like there, there is many individual contributors that um, helped me out, but I, I, I really want to shout out especially Steve Welzer because Steve Welzer is a veteran of the Green Movement and he contributed a very significant portion uh, to help me go to Korea. So thank you, Steve, and thank you to uh, all the, the, the parties that um, helped send me. Other than that, if you want to stay back and chat, let me know, but I think J Joseph Naham had a question. No, if, if I could chat afterwards, that would be helpful. Okay, great. If you all want to dip or just stay back to chat with further questions, I will be here. I don't know if anybody else wants to stay, but yeah. Thanks, friends. Thanks for joining. Thanks, everyone. How do we turn off recording? There it is. <laughs>